Hello, everyone. We're going to do our notes for topic 1.4, which is demand. I think this uh, topic might be a little bit easier for some of you guys to wrap your brain around because some of the concepts are just a little bit more uh, intuitive than maybe some of the things that we have been doing up until this point. So let me get my PowerPoint up and running and let's start moving through things. So first of all, this is the um, practice that I gave you at the end of lecture yesterday. So if you wanna pause the video right now, look this over. If you have any questions, ask your neighbor or you can send me an email. Otherwise I'm gonna keep moving. There also is a good Jacob Clifford video on YouTube. You can just search macroeconomics, topic 1.4, demand, boom, he'll pop up for you. Um, but I'm not going to show you the video right now. So let's go through your notes. Um, I didn't do the fill in the blanks for you guys. I think it might just be a little too complicated for you to try and worry about blanks. I'm not even there. You can't ask me questions. So let's just go through what is demand, the different quantities of goods that consumers are both willing and able to buy. So the difference is you might be able to buy something, but if you aren't willing to buy something, then that doesn't count as demand because in theory, any person could potentially buy anything. But for example, um, if you're not in the market for diapers, if you don't have kids, you might be able to purchase them, but you're definitely not willing to, so you don't get calculated in to the demand numbers. Uh, let's talk now about law of demand. There is an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. And basically what that means is as one of them goes up, the other one goes down. As price is up, quantity demanded is down. Kind of makes sense. The more expensive something is, the lower the demand for that item uh, becomes. So let's look at a potential uh, example here. I could be willing to sell A's in my AP economics classes. No questions asked, zero work involved. You just hand me a check. And if I was going to do that, what might the demand schedule look like? Just like every other type of data that we've been looking at, we're going to stick it on a table. And then after we stick it on a table, we could stick it into a chart based off of a reflection of the data on that table. So let's say I said an A costs $1,000. I might get maybe, maybe one taker in the class. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say quantity demanded is going to be pretty low. But if I brought it down to 750 I don't know, maybe there's two of you that really, really need that A in an AP class to help your GPA drop it down lower. Now it's only $500, zero work involved, automatic A. Four of you maybe might be interested. 250, you get the idea. If it was only $100 for an A, I bet a bunch of you might be willing to cough up the dough. So as price decreases, quantity demanded increases, they have an inverse relationship. <laughs> here's a funny one. Uh, here's a nice desktop computer. It's about 12 years old. Everything is outdated for the bargain price of $900. Uh, that's a pretty high price. How many quantity demanded do you think we're going to get for this old junky computer? Probably zero, right? So why does the law of demand occur? Uh, Occur. The law of demand is the result of three different things, and we're going to look at those three different things. Law of demand is related to number one, the substitution effect, number two, the income effect, and the law of diminishing marginal utility. Don't get stuck on those big giant words. We're going to go through each of them and talk about it. So why does the law of demand occur? First, let's talk about... Hold on. There it is. I was missing a title. Sorry. The substitution effect. If the price for one product goes up, the consumer is going to buy less of that and they're going to buy more of another complementary product. So if the price for Coke goes up, the quantity demanded for Coke goes down. But what might happen instead is people are going to start buying Pepsi. If Coke becomes $20 a 12 pack, 
mm, you know what, maybe I don't care that much about the difference between the taste in Coke and Pepsi. And so I'm going to buy a substitute good. So as the price for one goes up, the quantity demanded goes down, and then demand for that substitute product will probably increase. Next, the income effect. If the price goes down for a product, the power of your dollar increases. So for example, you might be able to purchase more for the same price as you were willing to pay before. So if flip-flops, I'm sure you guys have noticed, maybe not so much, it's been a little cold and I think you've only seen me for like three days before now, but if flip-flops are normally $40, and they're on sale now for $20, what do you think Miss Thies is going to do? Because I was willing to spend $40 for one pair. Duh, I'm going to buy two pairs of flip-flops. So as the price decreases, your purchasing power increases. Next, law of diminishing marginal utility. So let's talk about these words. Diminishing obviously means getting smaller. Marginal means a little bit extra. And then the word utility means satisfaction. You might want to put a little note out to the word marginal and just remind yourself that it means additional or extra. So what does the law of diminishing marginal utility mean? We get some sort of satisfaction out of the goods that we buy. We wouldn't buy them if we didn't like them, if we didn't get some sort of benefit out of having them. We have utility from the products that we buy. But the law of diminishing marginal utility says as you consume more of something, the additional satisfaction decreases and decreases and decreases. In other words, the more of anything you buy, the less satisfaction you're going to get when you tack on another one. Here is, we're not going to look at these discussion questions. Here's the perfect example of the law of diminishing marginal utility. You all saw the movie, Matilda. You all know when that giant chocolate cake came out. Oh man, cake. Yes. Amazing. I'm so excited. That first bite of cake is sweet, amazing deliciousness. The 10th bite of cake, it's still good. The 20th bite of cake, oh, I don't know. I think I'm getting full. And by the time you get to the 50th bite of that sweet, delicious chocolate cake, you're probably ready to vomit. The satisfaction you got by adding each additional bite decreased. Okay, how do we graph demand? This is not a complicated relationship. It's a graphical representation of that demand schedule. So I showed you before, if a grade was $1,000, one person, if a grade was 750, two people, and we can make a coordinate point and graph that. The demand curve is always, always, always a downward sloping curve. Why? Because there's an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. So we're going to get a downward sloping curve. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you're looking at a demand curve, you have to make the same types of assumptions like we made with the product uh, PPC. We're just going to assume everything else is staying the same, that there's no other changes, and we're just going to keep everything the same. Let's draw a demand curve for milk. So here's our demand schedule. If I the price is $5. We're going to have 10 quantities demanded, $3, $30, dollars What happens? Quantity demanded significantly increases. So again, that downward sloping curve shows the relationship that as the price decreases, the quantity demanded increases. Okay. Ceteris so paribus a little bit of Latin for you, which means all other things held constant. And how do I remember that? I see the word peri and I kind of think of the word paralysis, like I can't move, nothing is, nothing is moving. And then I think of the bus. So everything standing still is the way that I think of that, like a paralyzed bus, nothing else is moving. So what happens if we take away the assumption that nothing else in the world could ever possibly change well, we're going to see some changes to the way demand looks. 
instead of just moving along the curve with the relationship between price and quantity demanded, what happens is the entire curve is going to shift. Just like when we were doing the PPC, when we had changes in technology, when we had a natural flood that wiped out all their resources, the whole curve can shift. And the same thing happens with the demand shift. So we're gonna look at what are the things that cause the entire curve to shift. And so a shift means the price stays the same, regardless of the price, the amount of demand either increases or decreases. There is a very specific difference between quantity demanded and actual increase in demand or decrease in demand. And this is gonna be the most confusing part of the lesson, but I'm really gonna try and like hammer it home for you. So hopefully by the time we're done, it'll stick for you. So what does it mean to have a shift in demand? Just like when the uh, PPC shifts, there's some sort of outside influence that's causing a change in demand that has absolutely nothing to do with price. Change in quantity demanded has everything exclusively to do with price. Shifts in demand or changes in demand have to do with outside influencing on the curve. So this is a change in demand, not a change in quantity demanded. I just said it again, price does not shift the curve. Price causes movement along the curve, moving from point A to point B to point C, but it does not cause a shift. The outside influencing factors are the things that cause a shift. So for example, if a study were released that said drinking milk increases your IQ by 30 points, what do you think would happen to the amount of demand for milk? The price stays the same, but what's going to happen to that demand in general, it's going to increase. People are going to say, hey, I want to get me some milk. I want to get a little bit smarter here. So I'm going to go out and buy some milk. And it doesn't matter. The price hasn't changed, but the quantity demanded has significantly increased. So what does that look like? A shift. There goes our demand curve shifting. This is what we call an increase in demand when the curve shifts. The outside influencing acting in this case was the scientific discovery that milk makes you a genius. So we're gonna see the demand shift. Prices don't change, but people still want more milk. What if there was a study that came out that said um, milk makes your hair fall out and causes baldness? Obviously, again, what's gonna to happen to quantity demanded? We're gonna see that significantly go down, but the price hasn't changed. And so the curve is going to shift in the other direction, and we're going to see a decrease in demand. So, <coughs> excuse me. Change in QD stands for what? quantity demanded. And then down here, we have demand curve one, and we have demand curve two, reflecting that change in demand. So there are two ways to increase the quantity from 10 to 20. One way you can do that is by price. If I lower the price down to $2, then my quantity demanded increases to 20. But the other way that I can change the quantity demanded is when we shift the entire curve. Notice that price is not affected, but I now have 20 units demanded. Okay, I've told you before, there's a trick question. There's always a trick question. So here it is. What happens to the demand for milk if the price of milk goes up? Don't be fooled. The answer is nothing, 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 nothing. The price going up 
the price going down, that causes a shift along the curve, but it does not shift the curve. Therefore, it does not change demand. The price changes quantity demanded. <laughs> Here's a good meme for you. Oh, my little Star Wars people. Okay, what causes shifts in demand? Here we come. There's five of them. Fancy vocabulary could be that we call them the determinants of demand. So out to the side in your notes, if you want to add that fancy word determinant of demand, anytime we have the opportunity to sprinkle in a $20 word when you're writing, sprinkle in that $20 word. So determinant or, <coughs> excuse me, shifters of demand. One, taste and preferences. Two, number of consumers. Three, price of related goods. Four is income. And then five is future expectations. Now, shockingly enough, we're going to go through this list. Some I'm going to give you some expanded notes on. Some are a little bit more obvious. And I'm just going to give you like a little one word, one sentence explanation for it. Again, I'm hammering this point home. If you feel like I've said this 10 times, it's because I'm saying it 10 times on purpose. A change in price does not shift the curve. It causes movement along the curve. Outside influences separate from price are what cause a shift in the curve or what we call the shifters or the determinants of demand. So. <laughs> Excuse me. Prices of related goods. Oh, wait. You know what? Let me go back to this. I think I added this in your notes. Example for taste and preferences. This is in your notes. When I was younger, people collected Beanie Babies. Oh my God, people lost their mind for Beanie Babies. But that's not really like a thing that people do anymore. They don't really collect Beanie Babies anymore. Or maybe, you know, like record players. People don't really use record players. I know like hipster, cool guys like to be like, oh, here's my record player. But for the most part, taste and preferences have evolved. We don't use record players anymore. We don't even use CD players anymore. So the demand is going to shift for those products. Next, number of consumers. If there's like a giant wave of immigration and all of a sudden you have a massive influx of people into the market, so the potential to buy things is greater, that's also going to cause a shift in the demand curve because now there's more consumers, so demand is going to shift. So now let's get to number three, price of related goods. So the demand for one good could possibly be affected by the price of another good. And this is where things get kind of tricky because I just told you that price does not shift the curve. And that means that the price of the good that's being represented on that curve does not shift the curve. But the price of another good could possibly cause a shift. So what do I mean by that? First of all, substitutes are goods that are used in place from one to the other. They're easily interchangeable with each other. So if the price of Pepsi falls, now Pepsi only costs $2 for a 12 pack. What's gonna happen to the demand for Coke? Are people gonna buy more Pepsi? Or are they gonna buy more Coke? They're gonna buy more Pepsi. So that's gonna cause a shift in the demand curve for Coke. If the price of one increases, the demand for the other will increase. I have some pictures to show you on the next slide, so it'll make a little bit more sense. Complements are two goods that are bought and often used together, like hot dogs and hot dog buns. So if the price of hot dogs falls, what's gonna happen to the demand for hot dog buns? If prices fall for hot dogs, they're cheaper. So people are going to buy more complementary goods in terms of hot dog buns. The price for one increases, the demand for the other <coughs> will fall. They have that inverse relationship. Okay, which of these are substitutes and which of these are complements? 
Well, of course, the different types of cereal, the generic and the uh, name brand cereal, those could be considered substitutes for each other. And then the bananas are complementary good to cereal. Why? Because a lot of people put sliced bananas on their cereal. Here's another example of substitute goods, right? There's really very little difference to a consumer between uh, the potatoes from Sam's farm and the potatoes from Fred's farm or drinking tea and coffee. Okay, maybe there's a little bit more, but those are still considered to be substitute goods. A hamburger from McDonald's, a hamburger from Burger King. If the price of a Burger King Whopper goes up, what happens to the demand for Big Macs? The demand is going to shift and increase because the price of a Whopper went up. Overall demand for Big Macs is also going to go up. Does that make sense to you guys? On the other side of it, let's talk about substitutes like peanut butter and jelly or ketchup and french fries, games to go with your Xbox. If the price of peanut butter increases, fewer people are going to buy peanut butter. And if fewer people are buying peanut butter, what's going to happen to the demand for jelly? That demand curve is going to shift and decrease because since the price for peanut butter went up, the complementary good jelly, fewer people are going to be buying that complementary good. Okay, what impact does income have on shifting the demand curve? So here's a little bit of like the snobbiest slide you're going to probably see in an economics class, but here it is. We call more expensive luxury type goods, we call them normal goods, which is a little judgy if you ask me, but whatever. So what would be an example? A, a Lexus, a Mercedes, um, seafood like, you know, lobster tail, um, jewelry, like real diamonds versus, um, uh, you know, cubit zirconia, um, houses versus apartments, normal goods. As income increases, the demand for normal goods increases. Duh, right? As you have more money, you want to buy nicer stuff. You're going to buy nicer products, unless you're my grandma who had a gajillion dollars and still argued over, you know, 17 cents on her receipt at Publix. That's a different story. As income falls, as income gets lower, the demand for these quote normal goods or the more expensive luxury type goods. And this could even be like the difference between, you know, name brand Cheerios and generic brand, you know, honey weedy loops that you might find on the bottom shelf at the grocery store. Then to be even more judgy, we're gonna call the um, less expensive or generic substitute for these products, we're gonna call them inferior goods. So things like ramen noodles, as opposed to um, getting you know, a bowl of lo mein at, at uh, P.F. Chang's. Um, or buying, you know, a used car with 100,000 miles on it, as opposed to buying a brand new Mercedes, going shopping for clothes at Goodwill, as opposed to, you know, going to, I don't know, where do you guys shop? The Louis Vuitton store. I don't know. Do they sell clothes there? I'm so out of touch. It's fine. As income increases, demand for these cheaper products falls. Why? Rich people like to buy expensive stuff for the most part. And who's buying these what are called, quote, super judgy way, inferior goods? Well, people who are on a tighter budget are looking for ways to pinch pennies. So they're buying these inferior um, substitute goods. As income falls, the demand increases because they don't have as much uh, disposable income. So what would be this would be the inferior good. The normal good comparison to this might be a honey baked ham that cost a hundred dollars. Um, you know, a canoe as opposed to a yacht. The actual super fancy Fruit Loops as opposed to the fruit rings. You get the idea. <coughs> okay, here are some practice questions. Uh, you can discuss these with your group. Which of the following will cause the demand? for milk to decrease. What do you think? That's right. 
a decrease in demand means that some sort of outside factor has played a role here to cause a shift in the whole curve. So a decrease in income, assuming that milk is a normal good, as opposed to, I don't know, putting water on your cereal. Which of the following will cause the quantity demanded for milk to decrease? What do you think? That's right, an increase in price. The only thing that causes that change in quantity demanded is a slide along the curve or movement along the curve, and that would be a change in price. In this case, an increase in the price of milk is going to cause a decrease in quantity demanded, moving from point A to point B to point C. Okay, um, the third page that you have there has this chart already uh, written on it, and there are some practice questions there. So um, I am going to encourage you in just a minute to pause the video. So we're going to consider a hamburger good, which is a normal good. Hamburger is expensive, right? So here are some scenarios. I think I have eight of these. Yes, I didn't go too far. Pause the video and you can work together as uh, partners if you want to and decide um, which shifter is in effect. Is it going to increase or decrease? Is it going to shift to the left or the right? What is going on in each of these scenarios? Okay, pause the video. Okay, now you've come back and here are the answers to the work that you just did. <clears throat> All right, guys, that's demand in a nutshell. Um, I think that this concept has a lot of, um, you know, self-explanatory concepts to it. You have that practice page in your topic packet. So if you want to go and look and do some practice there, if not, that's what I've got for you guys today. Hopefully I'll be back on Thursday um, and we'll get back to hanging out together live in person. I will record our lesson for, all right, wait, I'm going to use my brain. You think it's Tuesday. Notice the shirt I'm wearing is the same as the one you saw earlier today, but um, I will record our lesson for Wednesday again, and then hopefully I'll be back um, on Thursday to be with you guys live in person. If you have any questions at all, just send me a message in Canvas. I'll be more than happy to talk with you, explain things. Um, otherwise, see you guys.